Okay, uh, for those of you who've just joined us, welcome to our first evening of Watershed Resilience Virtual Seminar. Our panelists are gonna be joining us very, very soon. Uh, we're gonna cover some technical information and then we're gonna get right into it. My name is Tina. We have a, an interactive word cloud going on that you can do separately on your phone or on an extra tab on your web browser where you can enter three words where you feel most connected to your watershed. Uh, I'm just going to let you know where our panelists, I think, are coming in to uh, Councillor Jesse Kettler, if you want to take it away, Jesse. Great. Thanks, Tina. Well, hello, everyone. And welcome to the opening night of Watershed Resilience, Collaboration, Climate Change, and Landscape Restoration. My name is Jessie Kettler, and I'm a councillor for the Village of Cumberland and chair of the Comox Valley Regional District. I'm also a former environmental consultant with a master's degree in integrated water resource management, and I'll be your host this evening. Any discussion about land or water in the Comox Valley must start with respect and acknowledgement that we are settlers living and working in the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. So tonight we will start with a story offered to us for this evening's event by Comox, Comox artist, storyteller, and anthropologist, Annie Everson. So we'll cue that up. In the Comox Valley, the legend of Quinish tells how an old man had a dream where he was told to warn the Comox people to prepare for a coming disaster. The voice in the dream told him that soon the rain would begin to fall and it would not stop for a long, long time. This constant rain would result in tremendous flooding and the people must work hard to prepare themselves for this time. The Comox chief listened to the old man's story and due to his respect for his elders decided to take his advice. Groups were assigned various tasks, some to build more canoes, others to harvest much cedar bark and then have it prepared for weaving as many miles of rope would be needed. Fish had to be smoked, seafood dried and preserved, deer hunted, and the meat cured and made ready. Yet others were to make capes and woven hats that would be needed to shed the rain. Even the young children had to give up their games in order to help with the preparations. Finally, everything was ready and just in time. As the voice in the dream predicted, the rain began. A group of the strongest and wisest men was sent to the top of the glacier, where they were to find the ideal location to attach the cedar ropes. The place of attachment was crucial as the very future of the people depended on their correct choice. Before long, the rivers began to flood, so the canoes were loaded with their provisions, necessities and people, and attached to the cedar ropes from the glacier. Soon the waters rose above the totem poles, and each day they saw things that were familiar float by. The rain continued to pour, the people became frightened and the canoes required constant bailing. Days and nights passed and the waters rose up the sides of the mountains. The rain was relentless. Eventually the day came when the glacier was almost covered and every person began to pray to the Great Spirit. And then something they had never dreamed possible occurred. The glacier, the very one that they had seen and watched from a distance for many years, suddenly took on a life of its own. It began to float and broke through the surface of the floodwaters, the way a great whale breaches. At first the people were in awe of this unusual spectacle, but they soon began to understand what was happening. The people began to laugh and cheer and cry out to each other. The glacier is a huge white whale, they said, Quinish. Soon to their joy the rain stopped and for the first night in a long time they were able to have a comfortable sleep in their canoes. The next morning the sun shone through brightly and there was great excitement in the canoes. There was laughter and words of praise in their voices. The people began planning celebration for when they would be safely back at their village. As the water subsided, Quinish began to settle back into his former position where the people see him and admire him to this very day, overlooking the whole Comox Valley as if he were resting upon a throne. 
So honored is Quinish that on the tribal grounds by the Comox estuary, he is symbolized in paint on the front of one of the remaining longhouses. Here the people assemble, dance and sing in the shadow of Quinish. Okay, the legend of Quinish is central to who we are as a community. The glacier looms large in the Comox Valley. It reflects the rich indigenous history of this place, as well as the reality of how climate change is impacting the local landscape. Tonight, we are exploring these altered landscapes. The work underway to understand and address the fragmentation of land and water. The local landscape has always been changing, but in the past 150 years, the arrival of settlers to this land of plenty has accelerated the pace and impact of change. I'm pleased to be here tonight and to host this event titled Stitching Together Altered Landscapes and thank the Comox Valley Land Trust, the Cumberland Community Forest Society and the CVRDs Connected by Water for all their work in presenting this exciting and engaging event. Events like these are important for not only sharing knowledge of the natural environment of which we're all a part, but also to ensure we are planning for a sustainable future. While we have altered our local landscape dramatically over the years in ways that can increase climate impact risk, we can also take action and leverage these landscapes to build a climate resilient Comox Valley. One way the Comox Valley Regional District is building resilience is through the protection of our drinking water. High quality drinking water is only produced by a healthy ecosystem. Our watershed protection plan guides the management of the Comox Lake watershed. But in order to implement this plan, it requires close collaboration with conservation organizations, local governments, private companies, and members of our community. This important cooperative work can help ensure our watershed remains healthy in the face of a changing climate and growing community. These kinds of conservation projects require a great deal of cooperation as well as knowledge sharing and require us to not only know where we've been, but where we want to be. Tonight, we have four presenters and I'm gonna introduce them all now and let them take it away after that. First, we have Jesse Morin. He's an archeologist and researcher for Comox First Nation with a focus on prehistoric archeology span and primary research area in the Canadian Plateau and Northwest, Northwest Coast. His interest is particularly in the development of social complexity among gatherer, hunter gatherers and the dynamic nature of indigenous trade and exchange relationships within this region during the last 4,000 years. Next, we have Megan Kersens. She's an interdisciplinary conservationist and nonprofit leader with over 25 years experience in the environmental, cultural, and economic development sectors in the Salish Sea region. She's the executive director of the Cumberland Community Forest Society, a steering committee member with the Comox Valley Conservation Partnership, and a watershed protection public educator for the CVRD. In her spare time, which she probably doesn't have much of, she produces climate theater with children and adults in the village of Cumberland, plays music and helps protect bats. Megan is a high energy organizer, workshop leader, facilitator and presenter with a passion for bringing together diverse disciplines to build resilient community. After Megan, we have Tim Ennis. He's a conservation biologist and executive director of the Comox Valley Land Trust and Conservation Partnership. He has over 20 years of experience working to protect and restore biodiversity in BC. Tim volunteers for the steering committee of the Coastal Douglas Fir Conservation Partnership, which works to protect and restore environmental values in the Salish Sea region. His work has involved extensive education and outreach components including national, provincial, and local television, radio, print, and online media. Tim is a fourth generation Vancouver Islander and spends his free time mountaineering, backcountry skiing, hiking, kayaking, hunting, mountain biking, all over the island and beyond. 
And last but not least, we have Jennifer Southhurst, a biologist and environmental scientist that has worked as an environmental professional and stewardship leader most of her career. With extensive experience in freshwater, marine, and terrestrial ecosystems, including projects as diverse as research on climate change for Simon Fraser University to, to traditional ecological knowledge surveys of marine mammals for the Namgish First Nation. She is a stream keeper and wetland keeper instructor and has worked extensively with multidisciplinary teams of volunteers, First Nations, government agencies, and nonprofits to achieve habitat protection and stewardship objectives. She is currently working as the project manager and estuary coordinator for the Comox Valley Project Watershed Society. Now that you're all familiar with our presenters, I will pass it over to Jesse Morin to begin tonight's presentation. First of all, thank you for the excellent introduction, Jesse, and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, it seems like it was a really long time ago when Tim asked me to put this together, and I honestly can't remember the exact wording of what he asked for. Uh, but the way I remember it, it was sort of to sketch together some backcasting, looking back through the deep time perspective about how KFN's ancestors lived in this environment, in this Comox Valley and the traditional territory, through these series of climatic uh, change cycles that we know have occurred throughout the past. So that's what I've stitched together. This first slide here is a, uh, the 1865 photo of KFN's village. This is pretty much where the administration building is now, if you guys know the area. Uh, I always try to introduce this as, this is where we are. So this is the first slide in most of my, my presentation. Some of you maybe have heard me rattle on before here. So I apologize for that. There'll be some overlap. So thinking deep time, you know, KFN, in my perspective, their ancestors have been in this territory for a very, very long time. Uh, you know, human occupation, as far as we could, as archaeologists can tell, really started in Western North America and really the Americas after the end of the Pleistocene. So before that time, you know, 14,000 years ago, most of British Columbia, including the Comox Valley, was deeply buried under glaciers. You know, Quinesh at that time was much, much bigger. Um, but after 14,000 years ago, these glaciers melted very, very rapidly um, and sea levels rose very rapidly. So the landscape looked very, very different. Now, after that period of time of a very rapid change, we, we come into this geological time frame called the Holocene, where the environment was, was similar today, you know, smaller amount of variation. Um, but for this, this last 10,000 years, this is the environment where I, I'm under the impression that KFN ancestors lived uh, modified the environment and adapted to the range of resources and, and changes in cycles um, over this long-term period. So I'm going to walk us through some of these major periods uh, and climatic shifts that happened in the past and identify what I think are some clear cultural behavioral responses or adaptations to, uh, to adjust their, their long-term behavior to these changes in the environment. So here, we're yeah, see, do you think you could put it into slide mode so that oh. we could see, um, yeah, the full screen? That'd be great. Are we good? Thank you. Okay, so this is what the Comox Valley looked like in the Pleistocene, right? Uh, certainly, if humans lived in this area during the Pleistocene, they would have been adapting to a very different environment 16,000 years ago than how it looks today. Um, it's rugged. There's not a lot of land exposed. There's certainly some land exposed on Vancouver Island even, but not a lot. Um, it would be a Arctic tundra type environment at all. If there's, if there's live things to eat, it's going to be uh, much more similar to sort of Ellesmere Island than Vancouver Island as we currently know it. So moving forward in time, um, this is a map of Quadra Island right at the end of the Pleistocene after these glaciers have melted and the sea levels have rose really rapidly. Uh, reaching a maximum height of about 195 meters above sea level. This map I've borrowed from some researchers out of UVic in the Hakai Institute, and they've done some excellent research on Quadra Island, um, tracking these sea level changes through time. 
by identifying changes in the, the, the diatoms, I believe, from sediment cores that they pull out of these lakes. So they, they look at these, these levels in these cores that they pull out of the lakes, and they're looking at uh, marine, little marine microorganisms for, for strata working their way up. And then eventually they see uh, freshwater microorganisms. So they know at that time, that's when the environment shifted from marine to fresh. So, so looking at this map of Quadra Island, this is the environment that, that Comox's ancestors would have adapted to or seen as they first came into this environment as it was deglaciated 14,000 years ago. So Quadra Island isn't one island, it's a series of small little islets. Uh, Vancouver Island is a much smaller island and the Buttle Lake system, Campbell Lake system is actually a fjord, probably a, a marine environment leading inland. Um, so that's all to say the, the environment would have been very different. The landforms would have been very different. Um, and the Comox ancestors, we know their oral histories and they, they were described quite early and quite clearly. And they place their origins uh, not on the coastline, but well inland. Their, their, their first ancestors arrived at this environment at the junction of the Quinsum and Campbell rivers, many hundreds of meters inland from the modern shoreline. So, so what I think this, this story is telling us is the arrival of the first Comox people coming to uh, the Campbell River area and perhaps uh, first establishing themselves at the mouth of the Quinsome River. Um, we don't unfortunately ha have much archaeological evidence at Quinsome itself for this early occupation, but these same researchers who developed this great sea level curve for Quadra Island have now identified uh, excavating at a series of old relic beaches at this 195 meter shoreline, uh, old archaeological sites, and now have radiocarbon dates dating back to exactly this time frame. So this is some of the earliest human occupation in British Columbia. This is on a little island in the middle of the Salish Sea, so folks must have certainly gotten there by boat. Um, and my interpretation is these folks are ancestral Comox people. So here I've got a slide here representing um, a series of uh, temperature proxies taken from ice cores in Greenland. On the left side, we have these earlier time frames. On the right side, we're moving towards the modern period. I've ident identified some of these major um, climatic events here. And please note the typo, it's the medieval warm period, not the medieval war period, as we move to about uh, 1200 AD. So, so all I'd like to highlight here is that within the Holocene, the environment's fairly stable, but there are minor perturbations throughout it. That's what we see things going up and down repeatedly, uh, varying about normal, but never staying particularly constant. Some of these changes, I think we can see uh, behavioral responses in the archaeological record of how Comox people who are living in this place the entire time uh, change their behavior to adapt to these ecological changes. So in the early part of the Holocene, things were warmer and drier and very different here in British Columbia. These glaciers have retreated uh, many thousands of years ago now, but the environment doesn't look the same at all. Uh, we have different plant communities. A red cedar is notably absent. You know, these plants had to recolonize this environment just as humans colonized this environment. Plants had to recolonize this environment. <clears throat> and then rather, rather than the uh, hemlock Douglas fir forest, that really dominates this area now. We used to see much more of this Gary Oak environment. Um, there are patches of this in the Comox Valley now still. There are patches along Hornby Island and it's quite extensive down in Victoria. But where you see this a lot of is down in Oregon and way, way south of here. Because back then the environment here was much drier, much more similar it is to Western Oregon than it is today. Um, and this, this, these, these Gary Oak, prairies and meadows are important. They're important to indigenous economies because they're rich environments. Um, the, the Gary Oak itself, the acorns are edible. I have no evidence of people eating these acorns here in Oregon. They definitely did eat the acorns. But here, the two things that I think folks are most interested in in these environments is the camas itself. So in this slide, you'll see all those beautiful blue flowers. So at the base of all those flowers is, a, is an edible little tuber. It's gotta be cooked for two days and apparently it's quite tasty. Um, and folks ate these things in, in large quantities, tons. Families would dig literally tons of these, these camas bulbs up and roast them. They were a delicacy and actually traded quite widely as well. 
And also the, these camas meadows are nice open environments for grazing, grazing ungulates. So deer and elk, uh, you can support much higher quantities, much higher densities of deer and elk in environments like this than the denser uh, Douglas fir, hemlock sort of uh, dark forest that we know. So these are really rich uh, landscapes from the perspective of Aboriginal people who are living by hunting and gathering here. Um, and early on, you know, in those first thousand year, few thousand years of Comox ancestral use of these environments, this is the sort of landscape that they would have seen for, uh, for the first few thousand years. But by about 3000 BC, the environment's changing quite a bit. Uh, it's getting cooler, it's getting wetter. Uh, we have new plant species colonizing the area, red cedars moving into this area and becoming dominant for the first time. You know, talking about cultural changes, it's hard to imagine traditional Northwest cultures without red cedar, you know, their houses are made of red cedar, their clothes are made of red cedar, their canoes are made of red cedar, everything's made of red cedar. They were clearly living here for thousands and thousands of years without it, but that itself is a, is a, is a change, a pronounced change. So in this neoglacial period, the, the forest regimes are changing and these Gary Oak environments started to become choked out and, and, and shrink, decrease and move, move to the south um, because of this, this cooler, wetter regime and, and constant colonization by these conifers. Um, but they didn't disappear and we know they would have. They would have disappeared 4,000 years ago if it weren't for human intervention. We know this because in places where people have stopped interfering, these environments have disappeared uh, quite rapidly. Uh, if anyone wants a clear example of this, go to Heliwell Park on Hornby Island and you can walk uh, inland from the beach there that in the 1860s was described in the 1880s photographed as open Gary Oak Meadow and now it's being encroached upon by large Douglas firs and you can still see the standing dead Gary Oaks there, right? So over the course of 150 years, what was a vibrant Gary Oak community is now choked out by large, very, very large Douglas firs. And so what Aboriginal people did to, to, to maintain these really rich environments, to maintain the resources coming from these environments is artificially to burn the landscape on a seasonal basis, burn uh, the underbrush, burn these young conifers, the Gary Oaks are quite resistant to fire regimes and that's why they do well in drier, uh, drier environments. Um, but the Doug fir doesn't. So, so we know folks who are repeatedly burning this environment. We've got, you know, increased levels of, of charcoal and certain lake cores that we can analyze. And we know that these environments shrink quite rapidly. So, so in this situation, we've got an environment, an ecology that's changing, getting cooler and wetter. And we have a response by indigenous people of burning the environment using controlled burns for many thousands of years to maintain these open Gary Meadow patches. Um, and that's a, a major, you know, it, it's a technology, right? It's a technology of ecological modification to maintain the environment that you want. And when, you know, colonists first showed up in the Comox Valley, they, they talked about six or 8,000 acres of open prairie land, right? And this is Gary Oak Meadow extending from the junction of the Solom and the Puntledge River all the way up to Merville, right? This massive Gary Oak Meadow full of huge flocks of deer, huge number of elk, uh, berry plants, and all sorts of these rich resources. And that would have been gone unless these people were artificially burning it on a basically a seasonal basis. Okay. So I'm jumping forward several thousand years here into a time called the medieval warm period. So around 950 AD to 1250 AD, this is the same time things are going very well in Europe and all these beautiful cathedrals are being built. It's a period of moderate global warming. So the weather gets better at more northerly latitudes. Um, in places like we live here, uh, it got warmer and drier. There's an increase in forest fire frequency. And again, we can see this through increased charcoal density at uh, dated layers and sediment cores. If it's drier, the, the rivers are probably also a little bit, uh, a little less water flowing them, especially here on Eastern Vancouver Island where summer river levels are fairly low as it is. You know, the Fraser River and some of these monster rivers are probably not as severely affected by minor droughts, but these, these minor rivers such as, you know, the Courtney, the Cowich, you know, the Campbell would, could be quite severely affected by it. Now, during this period, we've got some, some data from the, 
paleoliminologists to extract these sediment cores and, and analyze, analyze the chemistry in these layers. And they've looked at these layers from Alaskan cores and, and they can identify the marine protein, the marine nitrogen that's coming in from the salmon, right? Everything else has a distinctive terrestrial protein signature. The only marine component is these salmon who are swimming upstream and then dying uh, in these lakes, of course. Um, and their analysis, their chemical analysis of these sediment cores suggests low salmon populations at this time. So things are, things are hotter and drier and a little less uh, productive for salmon perhaps. So this isn't, the data isn't exactly clear for this region that I'm, where we live right now here in the Comox Valley, but based on these other uh, proximate regions, it seems that this is probably the case at this period that salmon aren't doing too well. They're probably not doing too well on the Fraser River either, but the Fraser is just so damn big, it doesn't matter. There's still a hundred million fish going in that river. And um, from the archeologist perspective, this is a big issue. There are a lot of cultural issues, cult big cultural events going on at the mouth of the Fraser River right at this time as well. And that's probably drawing people into it. So anyway, in this context of decreased salmon uh, abundance, all of a sudden at the same time in this medieval warm period, we see these, the, uh, the, the, the sudden rapid and extensive appearance of the Comox Harbor fish traps, uh, a technologically sophisticated, uh, very well engineered and presumably exceedingly productive system of fish traps that are built all over the harbor. The one I have in front of you is about 300 meters in length and it probably has more than a thousand posts driven into the ground. Um, these posts would have had wicker work uh, lattice panels attached to them. I excavated one of these panels right off of Comox Reserve last year, a 500 year old panel that was clearly washed away in a storm. So this represents a huge invest, investment in effort. Um, Nancy Green, of course, has done a fantastic job mapping and dating these. So we have a number of radiocarbon dates from this fish trap in specific and a number of fish traps of this style. And what we see uh, is this chevron style fish trap appear quite suddenly. All of them are of this style. And Nancy's interpretation is that this style of fish trap is targeting herring. And that interpretation is based on the width and the angle of the entrance to these traps. So in her eyes, uh, this, this rapid and extensive appearance of, of fish trap technology is targeting herring, not salmon. And, and my interpretation here is that it's partly due to a decreased abundance in salmon at the time, and people are focusing their attention here, where salmon would probably be more effective on herring. Okay, so stepping forward a couple of hundred years, um, now we're moving into a time frame called the Little Ice Age, uh, things getting cooler and wetter especially in these northern latitudes, um, you know, several degrees cooler than today. You know, the early explorers records of coming into this environment, it was definitely a much cooler and, and more rugged place. You know, 200 years ago, you could walk a horse across the frozen river, Fraser River at Vancouver, right? That, that does not happen ever nowadays. So this, this, this period of, of global cooling you know, specifically in BC, it would have been cooler and wetter, you know, not frigid, but wetter. You know, Quiniche, the glacier would probably start expanding at this time, you know, it's being fed by all sorts of gold cold water. Um, and at the same time, we get more melt off and more runoff and just higher river volumes and lower river temperatures. And again, going up to Alaska where the data is good, again, these, these paleoliminologists who study the layers from, from sediment cores and lakes suggest that this time frame, uh, salmon are doing really well. There's greater salmon abundance in these lakes. So if there's more salmon around there, perhaps there's more salmon around here. I think it's the same sort of general process. And what do we see here in Comox, Pentlatch? Uh, we see the arrival, uh, the sudden, the very sudden arrival of a different style of fish trap built in exactly the same location. So instead of a chevron shaped fish trap, we have a heart shaped fish trap, sorry. The earlier herring fish traps are heart shaped. The later or the more recent salmon fish traps are chevron shaped. So Nancy Green again has dated these. These only occur in the most recent time frame. You know, about 1300 AD right up to 1850 AD seems to be the last one that was was constructed. Again, they're enormous. They're they're sophisticated. They're built in exactly the same area, uh, and she specifically 
thinks or hypothesizes that this style of fish trap is targeting salmon. And again, it's based on the opening of the width and the angle of the entrance to the trap. And I think there are uh, good reasons to support that hypothesis. Certainly the lattice work panel that I excavated with, with uh, Nancy Green, the spacing of the lattice suggests that it's used to target salmon. Uh, the spacing between the panel lengths are wide enough that the heron could probably escape, but salmon certainly couldn't. Uh, and that panel that we dated dates to about 500 years ago, so like to exactly this time frame, and would have been attached to a panel like this. So I think that uh, this rapid and sudden shift to a different style of fish trap is a Comox ancestral, you know, pentlatch people adapting to this uh, change in abundance of of the resource of a key resource that would have caught a lot of their attention, the salmon, uh, adjusted their fish traps accordingly. So in summary, KFN ancestors have adapted and survived a series of dramatic climatic changes. How do we know this? We know this because they're still here. And the archaeology says they've always been here. The oral histories say they were here before anybody else, and they're still here. So they survived. And how did they survive? They survived by adapting to changing circumstances. So in the past, these changes have structured where people could live it would have greatly affected their primary food resources. I talked about camas, salmon, and herring but pretty much all of their food resources would have been affected by these climatic cycles. I just highlighted what I thought are the big ones. So the precise details of these regional and global changes on fish are not entirely clear, but very likely had major impacts on local salmon and herring population. Um, and in my estimation, KFN's ancestor would have probably been getting upwards of 50 to 80% of their diet from those two groups of fish alone. So these are their, their staples. So KFN ancestors also adapted these changes by undertaking regular burning practices to maintain their, their preferred resource patches and adjusting harvested species with sophisticated technologies. So both trying to modify the environment and then modifying your tools to harvest the to harvest um, your key resources. You know, and I have no doubt that KFN is going to be here in another thousand years and probably another 10,000 years beyond that. And they're going to continue to adapt. The world will be different. The environment will be different. But I suspect they'll still be here. Uh, continuing their, their, their long-term adaptations to this human environment. Um, first off, to thank, thank Jesse for his presentation, and it's a perfect segue into um, what Megan and I want to say tonight. And this, this photo of the Comox Glacier, um, Quiniche, uh, I think really is a great tie together in terms of a theme. Um, we, we know that um, the, this landscape has changed a lot and, and continues to. Um, but uh, uh, no, no better bellwether than the, than the status of the glacier to, to keep us all tuned into that particular conversation. Um, yeah, and, and uh, as if it wasn't obvious, I wanted to thank also uh, the Comox First Nation for hosting us on their traditional territory this evening for this virtual webinar. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a little uh, leap ahead in time and jump into some of the impacts of settler history um, on the landscape. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start with this, which is, um, well, the unceded territory um, of the Comox First Nation was granted by a faraway government in Britain to the Hudson Bay Company. This charter of grant that you see here was in uh, January of 1849. And it was awarded to the Hudson Bay Company for the advancement of colonization and the encouragement of trade and commerce. It fell on the heels of um, actually what at that time was a bit of a diminishing fur trade, but set forth principles for the colonization of Vancouver Island. And the folks far away in Britain, probably on the first, you know, um, they seemed to think that there would be a, a, a bunch of prepped agricultural land ready to receive a bunch of farmers. But in fact, as this story unfolds, it, it becomes really clear that logging and mining would end up playing a much larger role in the development of the colony and in the altering of the landscape than perhaps um, was originally expected with this uh, fancy piece of paper that we see on the screen here um, right now. Yeah, thanks. And, and again, hearkening back to, um, to Jesse, this is um, a map from the 1860s and he would probably know, although I don't, who actually produced this map, but it came to me through um, Richard Mackey's book, The Wilderness Profound. And it, it looks at the environment of the Comox Valley in the 1860s. And uh, what we can see here in this land of plenty, just exactly what um, Jesse was talking about, is uh, these large areas here that are mapped out as prairie, as plains. 
These would have been those Gary Oak savannas and plains that, that Jesse referenced with the Camas. Um, of course, this estuary here, and, and Jennifer will tell us a lot more about that later, is one of the most productive and, and largest estuaries on the whole entire BC coast. And the landscape otherwise is flanked by, you know, huge forests of old growth Douglas fir and combined, this was just such a rich landscape with, with salmon, herring, clams, waterfowl, deer, elk. Uh, this is the, the landscape that uh, the first European colonists uh, would have noticed when they were arriving on, on these shores. And the, the first wave of colonists came um, in a, approximately 1861, uh, the first known um, European, European settler who stayed year round was a fellow named George Mitchell. In the spring of 1861, he arrived um, and he, uh, he started a family with an indigenous woman and um, began farming in the area. And it was the one that brought cattle for the first time, for example, to, to the Comox Valley. There were five other settlers that joined him uh, in that spring, but he was the only one that stuck around. And um, it wasn't until the following year that uh, additional colonists came. And, and when they did, it was on this gunship, uh, the HMS Grappler, uh, that brought an additional load of colonists from, from Victoria in 1862. And uh, they preempted uh, 38 lots of land between essentially uh, Comox Bay and the junction of the Solomon and the, and the Pontledge River. Um, at that time, all of, all of them were former employees of the Hudson's Bay Company um, and, and had sort of been on the island, I guess, for a few seasons prior to moving up here. So I'm gonna turn us to Cumberland, which has a bit of a, definitely a role to play when we talk about the alteration of the local landscape, a significant one. Um, we're gonna jump ahead um, to about 1888 when uh, coal mining uh, started in the village of Cumberland or it wasn't the village of Cumberland then, it was Union. And the associated development of both Union and the village over the next 10 years had a very significant impact on the local landscape. These first houses in this slide were built in 1888 to support Dunsmere's Canadian collieries. And the settlers who arrived didn't know, you know what they were arriving into was a, a landscape, um, a, a sea of stumps and, and large stumps. Um, and an expectation that somehow you'd get a little vegetable garden growing in the back there. And, and as was mentioned also by Jesse, some cooler winters historically than what we experience today. We've heard from old timers in Cumberland that actually remember, you know, from their own childhoods, times when, you know, logging would be shut down at Comox Lake because there was way too much snow. Um, and this was a time period where the winters were a lot rougher than the winters that we're seeing, uh, that we're seeing today. In the spirit of altered landscapes, um, Cumberland's Chinatown is a really incredible story as well because Dunsmere essentially assigned um, one of the least um, uh, appealing um, part of uh, the landscape to the Chinese workers who were brought in uh, essentially indentured to work in, in his coal mines. And the first thing that happened there was that um, ditches had to be dug to drain these wetlands so that they could have, the buildings could be built on them and also um, gardens and market gardens could be developed. And we actually can still see the drainage ditches in the Cumberland wetlands through aerial photos and LIDAR and they continue to impact the state of the wetlands and things that we assume are this natural state around us were incredibly impacted by this significant um, Chinese community of upwards of 1500 um, individuals that were foundational to the development of the village of Cumberland. This picture is number four mine on the shores of Comox Lake and today this is known as Cole Beach. And you might know of Cole Beach either as a um, unsanctioned recreation user um, or because this is also some lands that have recently been secured by the CBRD as part of the Watershed Protection Plan. This was a slope mine and one of the most productive mines in Cumberland's history. A lot of coal brought out of the earth and workers often working up to their knees in water during high water season. Um, the hills along the lake shore now are actually made up of overburden that was sorted in advance of the coal being trucked away on trains so that you had a higher value coal heading out to Union Bay for coking. So even now when you look at those hills that have these huge trees growing out of them and that are, are definitely reclaiming into the landscape, those hills were created by this, this overburden um, and the coal was uh, in turn shipped to Union Bay for coking and processing. Um, Here's a photo of Union Bay um, and a heap of coke in Union Bay from 1920. 
Um, burning coal during the Industrial Revolution is pretty much one of the things that has kicked off the climate crisis that we are talking about every day in, uh, in our lives right now. And Cumberland's history as a coal mining town is a poignant reminder of the Comox Valley's role in the climate paradigm, and perhaps maybe the burden of responsibility that we feel in terms of the scale of conservation we take on as a community. Um, sometimes in more casual conversations, we talk about uh, closing the carbon loop in Cumberland, which would be a significant undertaking if you started to measure the amount of coal that was ripped out of the earth and shipped around the world to fuel the industrial revolution, steamships, trains, war machines, and all the things that um, have helped to shape uh, the landscape, uh, cultural, social, and economic context we find ourselves in today. Um, back to you, Tim. Yeah, and much like today, uh, we still rely really heavily on hydroelectric power to power um, mining um, and, and other uh, forms of natural resource extraction. Um, site C being a more recent example, but this is a photo taken in 1920 of uh, the dam that was built in 1912 on Comox Lake to provide that hydroelectric power to, to, to the mines in Cumberland. And what really blows my mind about this is that when this dam was constructed, they cut off uh, anadromous salmon access to the entire watershed upstream of this point, upstream of Comox Lake for a hundred years. And so, you know, now we are, we are dealing with, um, you know, this, this altered landscape above the lake of, of rivers that would have been vibrant with salmon that, uh, that have, are, are slowly crawling their way back from, from this, this sort of devastation. And, uh, and then fast forwarding a little bit in time, um, after World War I, uh, we had another wave of settlement happen here in the valley, uh, particularly with, uh, with soldiers returning from the war. And uh, what was different this time was instead of being able to really easily and rapidly colonize the, the Gary Oak ecosystems and prairies that were here, um, they, they began to clear the Douglas fir forests for farmland. Uh, with the dynamite that, uh, that they had free and easy access to. And so we started to see agricultural expansion, um, you know, further up, those, up the Solom, for example, in places like, like Merville and Grantham, where a lot of these old growth forests were, uh, were converted um, to, to essentially hay fields at, at that point in time. I'll jump in on that one, Tim. I, I told you I'd probably jump in and just recommend that anyone that's newer to the valley um, and hasn't read any Jack Hodgins to also highly recommend him. He's a, a, a fiction writer, but wrote extensively about the settlement of, of Merville and the circumstance of World War I soldiers returning home with PTSD after we're serving in trench warfare in Europe and being handled a, handed a track of land and a box of dynamite um, with which to go forth and, um, and build community and raise a family. Uh, phenomenal reading that really grounds you in place. And I know uh, Jennifer is going to speak much more to the marine environment um, in, a, in a moment, but um, it, this is a phenomenal photo uh, from what I think is Hornby Island. And uh, just, just, just to speak of the impacts that we had on the marine environment in these early years too. The, this is a group of, of two men standing in the center of the photo in front of what are three very large piles of whale bones. Um, you know, you can imagine the number of whales that were hunted in this, in this period of time. Uh, depleting, uh, you know, a major top predator um, uh, amongst other e ecologically significant species in, in our marine environments in this, in this early time of, of contact as well. Amazing. Well, take us back kind of up into the mountains and or in, back into those Douglas fir forests. And this is a photo of, you know, early days of, of Comox logging. Well, logging got started pretty much right away in the valley bottoms in Comox Lake in about like the late 1870s, 1880s. And early settled, many of the early settlers who came to farm found logging a much more viable exercise uh, than farming. And, and many of those families transitioned into what became a very significant logging community that had ripples all over the coast. Um, so this is, um, yeah, a picture of, uh, from also out near Comox Lake. This is the A-frame crew at Comox Lake. Now, 
thinking about that environment, the Comox Lake, almost the entire watershed was logged um, um, in these in these early years, um, with the exceptions maybe of some very steep slopes where there was where access was difficult. The mouths and riparian areas of all the creeks, rivers, and streams were also harvested, and the critical role that big trees and vegetation played in holding banks together was compromised permanently. When you move trees of that scale and that size out of an environment, uh, it's very difficult for smaller trees to reestablish themselves um, because all the good work that those plants and trees have been doing to mitigate flow and to temper the flow um, are eliminated when, they, when, they're, return, when they're removed. Um, um, Comox Logging Company in 1927, this photo, initially logging was done by trains and coal-fired steam engines. So not only were they using super dirty fossil fuels, um, they were using them to demolish natural carbon stores. So this is like the double whammy and then throw in all the coal mining happening in Cumberland. And again, we have contributed our fair share uh, to, the, to the mess we're in. Um, and, uh, and steep lakeshore areas were often far too difficult to get to by rail and that's why um, A-frames were used. over to you. Oh, let's go to failed attempts. There we go. Tim. Thank you. Um, yeah. And so as Megan alluded, um, there, uh, some of the earliest logging attempted to move the harvested logs down rivers to the ocean where they could be um, moved more easily to, to markets. But um, typically when they, when they tried to do that, it was by sort of damming the river and, and charging it full of logs and then undamming the river with a pulse of water for all those logs to flow down through the river systems to, to the ocean. And in particular with the Solon River that caused huge damage to, to the river banks and to the river itself. And they, they quickly realized that although that practice might have worked reasonably well in other parts of North America, it did not work very well here. So um, the, the move to, to rail-based logging um, really supported that need to move logs to the market uh, in a different method. And this is a photo um, from, or that last one was a photo of the, of the rails, um, the trains, sorry, bringing the logs down to the shoreline in Royston, uh, where they would dump them into the salt chuck. And then next one, Megan. And so Royston uh, was the, known as the largest log booming ground anywhere in North America for, for quite a while. And uh, these, these log booms sat there um, in the intertidal zone, uh, causing real disturbances to the salt marsh habitat and other marine env environments, um, you know, as, they, uh, as the high tides move, them, move, move the logs up and down. So real, real damage that way. Eventually, um, we moved to tr sort of truck-based logging um, everywhere, including here in the Comox Valley. And that was um, a, a modification that, that came about through the technological developments. Here you see an example of uh, the Madil Spar, which is one of the first um, tools that really enabled that to happen by being able to cable um, the logs from the, the bottom of the block up to the road. Um, but Thank you. So uh, despite logging, our influence on the landscape was much greater than just that. Um, back in those days, we didn't um, accumulate the slash from logging residuals and pile it and burn piles. They just left it scattered. And that turned out to be a bad idea because it really accentuated the risk of, of forest fires. And so this is a, a fire that happened um, in Mer this is Merville, 1922, where a, a major wildfire moved through. And this is an example of another one that happened in the Oyster River in 1938. Just complete elimination of the landscape other than bracken fern. Fast forward uh, multiple decades and our ability to, to harvest uh, timber from the landscape has, has really accelerated again with, with advancements in technology. Um, this is just an, a photo of um, the, the catalyst pulp mill in, uh, in Campbell River. Uh, we've become much more proficient at moving fiber off of the landscape since those early days. And, uh, and, and have become quite effective at, uh, at harvesting large areas. This is a, a photo of uh, the Crookshank watershed in the Comox Lake. 
area. And one of the one of the modifications that sort of comes along for the ride with uh, road-based logging systems is the impacts of roads on the hydrology of a watershed. Now, the logging roads that have been created recently in the last number of decades are far better engineered than they ever would have been back in the 18, uh, 1800s. Um, but still, the uh, the process of water moving through the soil downslope is somewhat um, truncated by a series of ditches and culverts that, that gathers up that water much more rapidly than would otherwise be the case and moves it to the reserving, uh, receiving surface waters uh, through that kind of snakes and ladders fast track process uh, than would, then would not naturally occur in, um, in a normal forest soils. So what, what happens there is we end up with large volumes of water during peak flood periods. Uh, this is a photo of the Crookshank in full flood uh, in, in the rainy season. Um, and then and dry rivers, dry creeks in the summer months during low flow periods where that base flow is, is not supported. And as, as Megan noted, um, a lot of our creeks and streams are really still struggling through the legacy effects of this historic logging. Uh, this is just a photo from Perseverance Creek of some of the old growth uh, western red cedar that were removed from the riparian area of the banks of, of Perseverance Creek. And um, just to note also that uh, an associated issue with that is the mobilization of gravel. Um, a lot of gravel moving down through these watercourses uh, from the higher elevations down into the floodplain flatter reaches where it accumulates exacerbating the problem of, of low flows in the summertime where we're at the point where many of our um, creeks essentially run dry. Uh, they're not really dry, it's just that the water is subsurface moving through these massive gravel bars. Um, and that's a, a big problem on the on the Solom again, but but in other places as well. Um, and the, the Comox Guardians and Solar River Restoration Society and others are working hard on trying to uh, uh, figure that out. Um, but as, as technological advancements continue, um, we're now able, through the use of uh, tools such as this uh, photo here of a, what we call a tethered feller buncher, to log increasingly higher and higher up the slopes and on steeper and steeper slopes. So tether, tethered feller bunchers essentially are um, feller bunchers that are rappel down the side of the mountain, attached by cables um, so they don't fall off the hillside. Uh, to be able to access timber that that was you know maybe previously um, unreachable. So these are a couple of photos of um, sediment plumes, one in Beach Creek on the left and in the Crookshank on the right. And sediment is naturally occurring in watershed sense. Sediment is naturally occurring in water, but the historic changes to the hydrology of the landscape coupled with increased storm intensity uh, due to climate change are adding up. It's all about accumulative impacts and adding up to an issue um, for um, turbidity levels in local drinking water. Um, and that term turbidity may be familiar to some because the turbidity is the issue that has triggered um, boil water advisories historically um, uh, because it's very difficult to, um, to uh, treat uh, water that is, has high turbidity or high sediment levels. So um, this is very much part of the story of the Comox Lake watershed and these familiar pictures of these uh, sediment plumes that are the result of cumulative um, factors. Um, this is a familiar landscape if you've lived here for a while. I don't know, I'd be interested how many of you remember this of driving across the 17th Street Bridge and you would look down to your right and you would see this, you know, this facility, amazing noise, tons of people going to work. Um, every day. This was one of the last sort of tangible connections that the Comox Valley has had between harvesting and processing. There's harvesting that happens now, but there isn't that sort of grounded, uh, uh, tangible thing that we see on the landscape that links it to the culture and the economy um, of our community. On the left Just here, to note that that's the, uh, a shot of the, uh, the field sawmill site. Yeah, field sawmill site, yes. Um, and this is what the Courtney River on the left used to look like before it was channelized and diked. It had a natural capacity to absorb and release tides and storms. Plants and trees held the banks together, which we've talked about in the watershed, offered hiding places for migrating salmon. And on the right is a constructed wall, offering no refuge for salmon and no absorption to the natural ebb and flow of the ocean. 
this photo here is from 2014. It was a big year for flooding and there have been others since in the city of Courtney. And again, you can kind of follow your eyes along the, the altered riverbanks that have diminished the capacity to absorb weather events. And another layer on that is a loss of surface permeability due to development. And we have a perfect storm when we start to add up all of those factors. And this isn't to say that flooding didn't happen historically because it did. The shot is from 1939, but remarkably we kept building and we kept building on floodplains. Human beings are such curious creatures. Uh, this is a photo again from 1939. And, and then I, I wanted to speak briefly again about the intertidal habitat. So this is an example of um, the one last little remnant I could find of our, our coastal sand dune uh, communities here in the Comox Valley. This is uh, uh, in, in uh, electoral area B, I believe, just past Comox. And this is uh, illustrative of, of kind of what a natural sand dune, backshore sand dune should look like, of which we had an extensive array here in the Comox Valley, which most of them look like this now. So we've, we've armored them with uh, riprap or other, other um, you know, logs and other things to try and, um, you know, prevent what we think of as, as a, a natural processes of erosion and accretion from happening, um, which, which doesn't necessarily work in our favor. This um, armoring tends to steepen and shorten the, the beaches along the shoreline, which, which can dramatically reduce habitat available to um, forage fish that would typically spawn on the shoreline, for example. Similarly, uh, what we call feeder bluffs, these big, these big eroding cliffs that provide the raw material for sand spits like Goose Spit or um, uh, the, the north end of Denman Island um, have typically been armored at their bases to resist erosion. Next slide, if you don't mind, Megan, um, such as here. And you'll see they're, they're starting to vegetate now, often with um, scotch broom, uh, invasive species, uh, essentially choking the, the environment of the sediments necessary to replenish those, those dune and spit communities. And uh, again, hearkening back to Jesse's presentation, this is a photo of an intact deep soil Gary Oak ecosystem in the Cowichan Valley. Um, and this is what would have occurred over thousands of acres as well here in the Comox Valley. Again, the camas flower uh, that Jeffrey, Jesse referenced as being one of the most important food crops for first people. But this is what uh, most of our deep soil Gary Oak ecosystems look like now. Uh, this happens to be uh, Vanier School, but um, much of the other uh, savanna habitat um, is, is typically farmland. Some of these uh, amazing massive Gary Oak trees uh, still, still persist inside of, those, inside of those agricultural areas. And then we have intensive residential development, which continues. Um, and this is a photo uh, from Cumberland. Um, we are chewing through more land every day as we continue to pursue single occupancy residential dwellings and, uh, and absorb uh, the demand for that that's, that's coming into our valley. And, and not only are we chewing up the landscape, but we have situations where we're actually fully altering, uh, altering hydrology through blasting and culverting. And for those of you who live in Cumberland, we hear dynamite happening through uh, as part of the residential development process. And if you think about the fact that we're blowing up rock and we're, we are still altering the landscape in order to meet uh, industrial, uh, uh, commercial and development needs. We, this isn't all history. A lot of it is history, but a lot of it is, uh, is still continuing. The cumulative impacts of industrial development, deforestation, habitat conversion to farmland, residential expansion, both locally and globally has had a tremendous impact on the landscape and it is influencing climate change. Again, we come back to the glacier, which looms large as the symbol of this place we call home and of the indisputable changes to the climate. Glaciers are, are what's called very reflective. Um, they are one of the first things to show the impacts or the changes um, um, in patterns uh, and in weather patterns. And in the last seven years, the glacier has receded and thinned noticeably. Fred Byrne, who I believe is actually here tonight too, so hello Fred, has been taking photos at the same time every year, I believe it's late September, um, and we have two photos. And this is one uh, that he took in uh, 2013. And I'm gonna go back and forth a bit. And this is one from the same time period in 2020. 
So have a look at that. Maybe keep an eye on the sort of the bottom right and the exposure of rock. Um, and what's key is the time of year he's taking it. So he's taking it at a time where there isn't that new snowfall. So you really are looking at the, the situation of the actual ice. So we'll go back, this is 2013, same date in September, going forward to 2020. In fact, over the last few years, we've had two of the most severe winter droughts on record. That's made a lot of people anxious, including BC Hydro. Um, the accumulative changes are beginning to impact species that are familiar friends on the landscape. Plants like salal, red cedar. Um, they, we are beginning to see this visible evidence and this visible change, which includes the loss of species and also can, from time to time, well, not time to time, it also <laughs> means the introduction of species that aren't as familiar to us as well, more Mediterranean species like the Arbutus and things that you'd be more likely to find in more Mediterranean or Southern Island, Gulf Island climates. It, we are seeing visible change within the, um, within the forest ecology around us. And this slide is just sort of an icon of um, the fact that a, a lot of the species that we have here in the Comox Valley native species are at risk. Um, there's no, no, no doubt that some species that used to live here no longer do. And, um, and we have a number of others that are, that are um, at risk of, of becoming extirpated to the local community. This, this happens to be a photo of the sand verbena moth um, on a yellow sand verbena plant. Uh, which you would find on goose spit, uh, an extremely rare species. It's only known from a few places in the world, and, and this is one of them. Uh, so we, we need to be attentive to that. And, you know, this, this slide is kind of tongue in cheek. Um, it seems like uh, these days there maybe isn't a whole lot left holding up the tree of life here in the land of plenty. Um, but despite dragging you through a half an hour or more of, of fairly doom and gloom uh, presentations. Uh, I, I know that we're going to switch gears very quickly here and, and speak to you more about how do we stitch together this altered land and fragmented landscape into something um, positive, resilient, and, um, uh, you know, and healthy uh, for future generations. Because we can and, and we are. And that's going to be the major pivot from this point on. Um, this is a, an example of just some of the projects that have happened or, and are happening in the Comox Valley to sort of rebuild some of that resilience. So everything that you can see in red on this map is, uh, is a current uh, protected area. Um, over to the sort of the left-hand side there, you can see uh, the Perseverance Creek area and in Cumberland Community Forest area, um, supported by, uh, in, in yellow, um, the village of Cumberland's watershed protection areas. And then, uh, you know, on the lake there, uh, Village Park and the Comox Lake Ecological Reserve. Um, and then again in yellow, sort of towards the bottom end of Comox Lake, we've got uh, lands that have been newly acquired by the Comox Valley Regional District for watershed protection, um, lands owned by BC Hydro, moving down the Pontledge River, um, Nymph Falls uh, Regional Park, and the large area in green is an area that I'm going to speak to you next. This is a, a potential acquisition that the Comox Valley Land Trust is focusing on right now. It's the uh, what we call the Morrison Headwaters area. And then down into the estuary, of course, we can see that there are um, some significant areas that have been protected by Ducks Unlimited Canada, the Nature Trust, and then um, most recently um, the Project Watershed and the City of Courtney and Comox First Nations joint project uh, at Couscousum. Uh, right in the estuary, which which I know we'll speak more about later. So these projects are really cool in that they literally are connected hydrologically to one another from from upslope to downslope, and uh, is is a testament to how this community is rebuilding uh, some of these landscapes in in very meaningful ways. And so that's the end of our kind of doom and gloom section of the, uh, of the, of the uh, presentation. And now uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the project that the Comox Valley Land Trust is working on in the Morrison Creek headwaters, uh, be followed by Megan who's gonna talk a bit about um, the work that the Cumberland Community Forest Society is doing in, in the Perseverance Creek area. And then by Jennifer Sethurst, who's gonna talk about some of the, the positive work that uh, Project Watershed is doing in the intertidal zones 
um, and the marine environments uh, in, in our area. So just to start uh, up in Morrison Headwaters, um, this is an area that is probably what you would consider one of the last biggest core areas of unprotected habitat left in the eastern portion of the Comox Valley. It's a, a significant area, approximately a thousand acres in size, um, that has a, a, a remarkable amount of, of biodiversity value, um, which I want to speak about. And, and in March of um, last year, the Comox Valley Land Trust was successful in um, acquiring a, a decent chunk of, of habitat here um, with the uh, pr participation of the funders that you can see down below, um, really kickstarting our, our uh, initiative overall to, to protect the entire headwaters. Uh, this is just a map of the area that we intend to acquire, um, kind of in the solid heavy red line, um, yellow being the areas that have already been protected. And what this map also shows in, in sort of cross-hatched or, um, or other, uh, I, I don't know what you call that, little swampy looking icons, are um, areas of wetlands and riparian areas that are also considered critical habitat for species at risk. And in particular, this area has some notable species at risk, including uh, the Morrison Creek lamprey, which is a, what we call a globally endemic species. And here you can see on the left, uh, Carly Palmer with uh, an example of an endangered Morrison Creek lamprey in a, in a little vase of, of some kind. It only occurs in Morrison Creek and nowhere else in the world. Um, this area is also really important for the Western Painted Turtle. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of wildlife in this area, including ridiculously dense populations of wide ranging carnivores, including um, very robust populations of black bear and cougar. So a super important area to keep large, large animals on the landscape on the Eastern portion of the Comox Valley. But one of the things that's most interesting about this project is that um, it has what we call a climate proof hydrology. So this is um, maybe a bit of a confusing diagram to some, but it shows from left to right um, in the blue line, what happens with water in this area. And so on the far left-hand side would be Comox Lake and the, uh, the water of Comox Lake essentially uh, seeps through uh, the glacial moraine of sand and gravel towards the right hand side of this diagram um, and pops up at the bottom of uh, the escarpment that sort of um, circumscribes the Morrison Creek headwaters as springs. And so regardless of the time of year, the, the springs uh, that support Morrison Creek are always providing cold, clear, fresh water year round um, into that system. And, um, and so it has this climate proof hydrology that's not affected by some of these other patterns that, that we described previously, which makes it um, one of the most important salmon bearing streams on the whole east side of Vancouver Island. According to DFO, it is the most important salmon bearing stream on the east side of Vancouver Island for its size. And so this, this of course, the salmon support uh, a huge amount of, of uh, biodiversity, including some of the, the bears and whatnot that I mentioned before. Um, but this project is, is absolutely critical to sustaining um, some of these iconic species on the landscape here in the Comox Valley. So we're very excited to be um, ramping up in the months ahead on, on this project. And we really look forward to um, achieving success and protecting this very critical piece of core habitat in, in the Comox Valley. So I'm going to jump in and just do a little bit of a backstory on the, or not a backstory, a current story on the Cumberland Forest and per Perseverance Creek. Uh, the way I describe it is I'm, I'm here to represent um, a watershed called Perseverance and she's had some bad press. Um, this again is a photo of um, uh, 2015, I believe is this one, of uh, sediment plumes um, in Perseverance Creek. Um, she's had some work done over the years and not all of it has worked out. Um, there's some undersized culverting, historic road building, uh, complete rerouting of the creek at different points. Um, 
as we've mentioned, uh, for Cumberland's Chinatown and then subsequently for other land uses in the wetlands and the floodplain of Perseverance Creek. Um, but underneath it all, um, there's a story and an important story. And that is that, yes, we've altered this landscape. And yes, our communities have inherited this altered landscape. Um, and yes, these inherited la um, um, landscapes have ripple effects for the rest of the valley, but that it is possible for us to be stitching them back together. Uh, the Perseverance story is completely linked to the larger Comox Lake story. Uh, Comox Lake is this incredible resource that is relied on by over 45,000 valley residents for water and countless others as access to both recreation and wilderness. But watershed protection can be overwhelming, especially in the context of private ownership in the Comox Lake watershed. It's huge. Um, but the Perseverance Project gives us an opportunity to look at our watershed in smaller components and see what's possible if we do these sort of bite-sized pieces. Um, and we can begin to kind of wrap our head around what is possible. Perseverance is one of the sub watersheds of the Comox Lake watershed. And you'll see it in blue on the far right of the, of the screen. It's sort of that brighter blue color and it's connected to the Cumberland Creek watershed. Um, and those are sub watersheds of Comox Lake, which, which flow into Comox Lake. And um, if we kind of uh, drill down another layer, a slightly closer look, you can have a look at what the Cumberland Community Forest Society and the village of Cumberland have been doing for, for 20 years. And the Cumberland Forest Society was always clear that they were protecting for wildlife habitat, biodiversity, carbon storage, quality of life. But in the past few years, we've, begin to, we've begun to understand that our work is also about cultivating climate resilience and source water protection, source drinking water protection, because we are a sub watershed of this larger system. Because all the climate scientists, science is telling us right now that we're going to be seeing a lot less of this white stuff and a lot more of this stuff. And without intact forest creeks and riparian areas to hold and store and filter this water, it's going to be like our taps are on all the time. No bank account no place to hold this water in reserve for those dry spells, for those droughts that we see happening with more increased frequency. So on September 1st, 2020, 90.6 hectares or 225 acres of land in the Perseverance Creek watershed was purchased by, um, from local timber companies, specifically Hancock Resource Group. And a large part of Perseverance Creek runs right through the middle of it. And we've been working with our partners with the village of Cumberland the Comox Valley Land Trust and the Comox Valley Regional District to protect this land and to jointly develop an amazing conservation covenant that includes significant watershed protection and biodiversity protection zones. The combined purchases in 2005 and 2016 and then September adds up to 500 acres of watershed forest protected for biodiversity, source water protection, low impact recreation and climate resilience. And we are not done yet. We're so excited about what the future holds if the same levels of collaboration and landscape skill thinking to, um, continue to be characteristic in our community. Um, this is a remarkable time to be working in climate resilience and in source water protection and in conservation. And I feel just truly honored to be in the company that I am in tonight with Tim, with Jennifer, with both Jessies, <laughs> with Tina and Kara in the background, just so many of you that are out there. This is a remarkable time and we thank you so much for sharing in uh, a reflection of that this evening. Um, and without further ado, cause I know, um, oh, actually what we're gonna do is Tina's gonna make a stretch really quickly. Cause we know Tim and I have been talking. Jennifer's gonna queue up her presentation. I'm gonna stop share. There we go. Okay, so a really quick stretch because Zoom fatigue is real. Uh, some of you, as I have, have probably been on the computer a lot today. So I just want to do a quick uh, under a minute uh, challenge for you to stand up, look away from the screen, listen to my voice, and I want you to move in your room and touch something blue in keeping with the water theme. If you can see something blue in your space, touch it. And if you see something soft in your room, even if it's your own shirt, move around and touch that soft thing, water soft. And then I want you to find something that's a source of comfort to you and point to it or touch it. Think about how comforting it is. And then if you have a drink in your room or if you need to run to the washroom right now and get a drink, touch something that is wet because we're talking about water tonight. 
And just again, make sure that you look away from the screen. And then I'm gonna invite uh, Jesse back into the fold to introduce our next presentation. Um, yeah. Awesome, <clears throat> thanks Tina. I, I needed that sip of water. Um, yeah, so next we have Jennifer Southers and I think she's been getting ready while we were stretching. Jennifer, are you there? Yep, I should be here and my screen should be shared now. So hopefully you can see that. Yes, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, I'm so pleased to be here on behalf of Project Watershed tonight. And uh, just, you know, with my colleagues here in the Valley, it's really inspiring to see the movement that's happening here, the synergy that's happening here. I think it's a pretty special time. Yes, we do have some uh, challenges with the current climate crisis, um, but I think we also have some opportunities to focus our work in such a way as to adapt to a changing environment uh, and build resiliency. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about tonight. And for those of you that aren't aware, Project Watershed is a stewardship nonprofit organization. We've been around in the Valley for over 25 years now, focused on sensitive habitat stewardship. So I wanted to uh, kick off uh, my talk by starting to just look a little bit at um, the coastal ecosystem services that natural shorelines and in particular uh, marine vegetation provide. And this is something that uh, Project Watershed has been focused on with a lot of our restoration work uh, recently. So in addition, of course, to providing um, natural habitats for fish and wildlife, Natural coastlines also provide many ecosystem services, some of which can help mitigate um, the impacts of climate change. And this is a, a photo of um, coastal marine vegetation, also known as uh, salt marsh. And I'm just gonna make sure my slides don't seem to be changing for me. Oh, there we go. All right, and so this is bull kelp. And so kelp beds are another form of uh, marine vegetation, an important, uh, habitat uh, in the intertidal and subtidal areas, and also eelgrass beds. And all of these uh, types of marine vegetation can actually help to dissipate wave energy or buffer it and prevent erosion of sediments. Um, and also through photosynthesis, this marine vegetation um, absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequesters carbon. And all these functions can help mitigate some of the impacts of climate change. So what does that mean? That means that these habitats, we really need them more than for just uh, fish and wildlife, but also uh, to help us with the impacts of climate change. So in 2017, Project Watershed received a five-year uh, funding contribution from Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, to scale up some of the coastal restoration efforts that we've been doing. So we've been doing a lot of work um, in the Comox estuary specifically on eelgrass restoration, and we'd started to dabble in some salt marsh restoration. Um, and then we got this funding grant in 2017 and it really gave us some time to plan some of our work and to scale up the work that we were doing. Um, and the objective of this initiative is to restore eelgrass, kelp and salt marsh habitats, which form an important migratory corridor uh, for salmon, what we like to refer to sometimes as the salmon highway. And these habitats have really suffered from coastal development. So some of the impacts of development uh, that Tim and that uh, Megan so skillfully outlined in their presentations have also impacted coastal marine habitats. So development impacts, uh, you know, from logging obviously, but also foreshore hardening, the armoring of, the, of seawalls, that kind of thing. Marinas, log booming as well, dredging and infilling of estuaries as well as coastal pollution. So one of our overarching goals uh, when we're doing this work within the coastal zone is, um, and actually any of our work that we do within the watersheds as well, is to try and increase habitat connectivity. So when we alter the landscapes, uh, what, one of the things that we do is we fragment habitats. Um, so we're trying to reconnect some of those habitats if possible. And specifically, we're looking at the nearshore habitat uh, with this project. And the nearshore habitat is sort of the area uh, between the shoreline bluffs um, to where the water Comes to, becomes too deep for light to penetrate um, and support plant growth. Um, and this area includes a salt marsh zone as well as an eelgrass zone and a kelp zone. So whenever possible, what we're doing is we're doing work in an area and we're, if we're restoring salt marsh, we look to see if there's an opportunity within the same area to do an eelgrass transplant and restore that area. Can we look at getting kelp back into the area? So we're trying to really increase the connectivity of these habitats. 
So the first part of this large coastal restoration project that we undertook uh, included a comprehensive mapping component of all the near shore habitats within our study area uh, to determine the changes in eelgrass, kelp, and um, salt marsh distribution over time. So this is an example of uh, some mapping work that we did around the Trent River estuary, and it shows the salt marsh change in the area from 2005 uh, to 2016. So you can see that the black areas are where there's been no change, uh, the green areas where we've gained some salt marsh, and then the red areas are where we've lost habitat. So this is uh, the same uh, Trent River estuary, so same area, but this mapping shows the eelgrass change in the area from uh, 96 to 2016. And over that decade, you can see we lost a significant amount of eelgrass within that area. You can see all the red areas there. So potentially, this is a site then that might be good for eelgrass restoration. And this is another example from our mapping work. This is Mud Bay near the community of Fanny Bay. Um, and this is a salt marsh change there uh, between 96 and 2016. And again, you can see we've lost a lot of habitat in the area and the driver behind this is mostly coastal erosion. And so this is what it looks like on the ground, some of this coastal erosion. And you can see that we've lost a lot of the salt marsh platform here. And the main driver of this coastal erosion is climate change. So we've got increasing sea level rise, we're seeing more frequent and intense storm surges, um, and that's naturally eroding um, some of this really important sediments and materials that these salt marsh communities uh, rely on. So you can actually see how much of the salt marsh platform we've lost in this photo. We've got a clipboard there beside uh, this salt marsh bed that's actively eroding. Um, so yeah, so it's a little bit of a crisis in some of these areas. However, there is some hope. Um, Project Watershed, as I said, we've started doing some salt marsh restoration, and this is actually one of the sites uh, that we worked on just last year, um, and we're actively working to rebuild the salt marsh in this area. So now I just wanted to quickly go over some of the changes in kelp distribution that we've seen in our local area. Um, so this is, uh, you can see Comox Estuary here. This is a, a large kelp bed that was uh, there in 1969. So this imagery is uh, the habitat that we had in 1969. It stretched kind of from the Willamar Bluffs area all the way down to Tree Island. And there was another smaller bed here south of the uh, Trent River estuary near Spindrift Road. And then this is what this area looked like uh, between 1995 and 2005. And you can see we're starting to sort of lose some of the outer areas extents of this kelp bed. Um, and we've also completely lost the small kelp bed that was uh, around Spindrift Road area. And then this is what it looks like in 2018 and it's not a good story. So we've lost all of the kelp habitat in the area and this is specifically uh, bull kelp habitat and beds that I'm referring to. And kelp beds provide a lot of habitat for fish and invertebrates and they also help reduce wave action as well. And in general, uh, the kelp story is really not a good one on the coast. Um, climate change is warming the ocean waters and causing early die off of the kelp before they can actually reproduce. Um, so what we're doing is we're working on growing bull kelp on lines from stock that is actually found growing naturally in warmer waters than ours to see if we can get it to grow here and to see if it'll do better than our local stocks are currently doing. So in 2019, we developed an overall coastal restoration plan for 120 kilometers of uh, coastline in our area. Uh, the northern extent is sort of the Deep Bay Bowser area, or sorry, that's the southern extent. And then the northern extent is the Oyster River estuary. So this plan provided an assessment of this entire area and looked at the historic changes in the distribution of these three marine vegetation types that I've been talking about. And then what we did is, so we mapped all the areas, we figured out where we had lost habitat, um, and then we looked at areas where we could do restoration projects. So we actually uh, divided the whole 120 kilometers into seven zones, and that was based on the shoreline type and the, the coastal climate. Um, and this is an excerpt from our plan. So this is uh, showing the work that was done for zone five and the potential projects that could be done in that area. The plan actually identifies uh, 70 potential projects. Um, 51 of those are restoration, 13 are actually protections. So there was some good news when we did this mapping work and this intensive survey of the area, we did find that there are some healthy areas of coastal habitat that we flagged for protection. And uh, six of the projects were more green shores type projects. And then the projects were actually ranked as uh, medium high or low priority to undertake. 
And then what we're doing um, as part of our work now is we're slowly actively chipping away at some of these projects and undertaking them. So we're doing intertidal eelgrass transplanting with volunteers. And here's some of our volunteers at work getting some eelgrass ready for transplanting. And we're doing uh, subtitle eelgrass transplanting as well in the deeper areas and that work's done with um, divers. And as well, we're also working on growing bull kelp on lines, as I mentioned. Um, and this is a close-up view of one of our sites where we're growing the kelp on the lines. And because it's an annual plant, we have to actually deploy new lines each year. And we're trying to figure out what's happening with our local wild kelp populations, how best can we grow kelp in warming waters, um, and can cultivated kelp reproduce and become self-sustaining. Um, we've also been working to rebuild salt marsh habitat in our local area and this process consists of enriching beaches that uh, with sediment um, in areas where they've been suffering from coastal erosion and i uh, just wanted to note too that we've incorporated um, a sea level rise factor into all the work that we do so the designs that we have for our, our salt marsh beds actually uh, take into consideration up to a 1.2 meter rise in sea level and so once we build these areas, we plant them with native salt marsh plants. Um, and we try and do a lot of education and outreach with that as well. We have crews of volunteers that come out and help us. And uh, we actually have gotten some students involved in helping with the planting as well. So this is an example of one of our first projects that we did uh, near the Royston Seaside Trail. And the regional district was concerned about erosion that was occurring near the trail. Um, so we built three salt marsh barrier islands at the site. And this type of project is referred to as a green shores design and as well as creating habitat for um, fish and wildlife. It can also protect the existing uh, foreshore from erosion due to wave action and storm surges, which was what the issue underlying issue was with the loss of this, this trail. So this type of approach is in contrast to some of the armoring that Tim mentioned, uh, where you're building seawalls or you're putting in hard riprap. And those can actually increase wave energy and cause more erosion in the surrounding areas that aren't armored. And Tim also mentioned the impacts to forage fish. Um, project Watershed has a really large forage fish project that we're doing right now. Um, so that's definitely a concern of ours as well. And also they can actually interfere with um, some use and recreation on the beach at times as well. So this is what uh, the site looked like after we built these three islands uh, in year one. And then this is what it looks like three years later. So you can see the area is starting to green up nicely and we're starting to get back um, some of the habitat in this area. And uh, we actually started to get some filling in of salt marsh plants, some new colonization in behind where we have built the islands because we kind of stabilized that area. And it's hard to see that it's three islands here, but there's actually channels that run all around the three islands. And the idea behind that is it allows for foraging opportunities for fish when they're feeding and the tide comes in, they can come up into these channels. Okay, so now for this last part of my uh, presentation, I want to refocus a little bit on the Comox Valley floodplain. And uh, Megan touched a little bit on this, but with climate change, of course, it's predicted that we're gonna get uh, heavier precipitation events. Um, and what we've done is we've built within our natural floodplain. So this is another shot of our, our floodplain. This is uh, the Puntledge River. Uh, and the Solemn River coming down to join to form, form the Courtney River, and then that then drains out into the Comox estuary. So in terms of how we need to adapt to um, climate change and what's happening, we now need to really start looking at opportunities for natural relief of floodwaters. And uh, there are several projects that we could do within our local uh, floodplain that Project Watershed has identified and some of which we're actually starting to actively pursue. And this is just another shot of the, the floodplain in full flood. This is an aerial image from the December 2014 flood that we had. And you can see that we've completely built within the natural floodplain. So of course this infrastructure is vulnerable to flooding. So with climate change, we need to look at uh, what we can do to adapt and we need to increase the natural flood relief where we can. Um, and there's some um, ideas that Project Watershed has for actually draining out Lewis Park back into the Courtney Slough here, connecting here this way and that would allow for a little bit of flood relief so that's an example of something we could do in the area um, but maybe we need to look at managed retreat to get some buildings that are extremely vulnerable out of these areas that are prone to flooding and then we just need to really identify locations where we can replace, uh, reclaim the natural floodplain habitat and functions so if we have the healthy hydrology if we have 
vegetation and we have absorptive capacity within the soils, then that's going to do a lot to buffer some of the, the flooding that we do experience. Um, and yeah, it's, it's nothing new. This is, uh, again, Courtney River, and you can see it's backed up here into, into Lewis Park. Um, as Megan mentioned, this is something that's been occurring in the community uh, for a long time. And in the 1930s, they actually installed a wooden uh, cribbing on either side of Courtney River, which extremely channelized the river. Um, and that was to help contain flooding and deal with flooding. And that was later replaced with um, concrete bin walls in the 1970s. And so this is a site that's uh, familiar to everybody now that we've uh, seen it a couple times in the slideshow. So this is the former field sawmill site. And this is after all the sawmill infrastructure has been removed. Um, and this is an area of the river that's been highly modified by human architecture um, and not in a good way. You know, it's we've obviously lost all the natural uh, functioning condition of this site and it's not going to provide any flood attenuation capacity. It doesn't provide any refuge for fish or wildlife. But it's another example of a site uh, that could be uh, reclaimed and we have an opportunity to do that. Um, this is just some images again of, of the site flooding. So Couscousum flooded significantly in uh, January 2009, uh, in 2010, and then also in uh, 2014 as well. Um, so currently another uh, impact of the, uh, the steel wall along the site. So what happened over time is the footprint of the, the sawmill infrastructure expanded and they actually accreted land. So they added soil to the site and they actually pushed into the river and they built the steel clad retaining wall to hold back all that extra soil and fill that they'd been, they put into there. Um, and seals are able to use that uh, steel siding opportunistically to easily trap salmon and prey on them and other fish, um, both out migrating juveniles and returning spawners. And so we've put a huge amount of effort and investment into restoring the Solemn and the Puntledge watersheds and Project Watershed has put a huge investment into restoring the estuary, uh, but connecting those things, connecting the upper watersheds and the lower estuary is the Courtney River. And this area in particular is very channelized and the fish don't really have much of a chance when they're uh, migrating to and from uh, the watersheds in the estuary. So this is uh, Project's Watershed's uh, vision uh, for a restored um, sawmill site. So this is the sawmill site here uh, connecting to Hollyhock Marsh. So we would like to see the site and we will renaturalize the site and that's going to benefit uh, fish and wildlife, but it's going to have some ancillary benefits too. It's going to create recreational opportunities and provide some natural flood relief as well. And then the site, once it's restored, will be protected for long-term conservation. So this reconnection of the natural floodplain um, is an example of building climate resilience. So we've been working on this particular project very actively with our two other partners, the Comox First Nation and the city of Courtney. Um, and right now we're in the land acquisition phase. We've been working to purchase the site uh, from the current owner Interfor, and we're on target and on track to wrap up that purchase by the end of November, which is very exciting. So that means we're gonna be starting the restoration of the site in the new year. And uh, with that, Good bit of news. I'll finish there. Uh, thank you for your time and attention yeah, tonight. And we just wanted to kind of circle back and reflect again on the theme of stitching together um, altered landscapes. Um, where am I out here? Oh, there we go. Um, so stitching together altered landscapes and that concept is about leaning into the spaces that we care really deeply about and finding ways to translate our desire to care for these places into action. And, uh, and it's about putting the pieces together to make this happen. It's landowners, local government, the conservation community, the community at large. This is a photo of the, of the Bevan Trails. And then we need to do things like activate our children. Um, and, and we know, you know, Project Watershed, the Cumberland Forest, many local organizations know how integral it is to link with this incredible community of families and children because they are, leading the way when it comes to demanding action on the part of parents and we see that so strongly in our work in in Cumberland and it's not just the kids because the grown-ups like to do crazy things sometimes too um here they are in Cumberland celebrating and building giant puppets and or sometimes passions are about running trail races or mountain bike events and and different ways that people express their deep love for this place that they live in 
Um, and uh, this passion is all about place. These are performance artists down at the Couscousum site uh, two years ago. And this beautiful, this is a Shane Phillip photo. Um, and sometimes it's even about a bit of spectacle. This was if anyone had a chance to be part of a bit of a wild and woolly project down there on the shores of the Courtney River with the um, Caravan Theatre Company and the, and the Nomadic Tempest. There's nothing wrong with a bit of spectacle now and then. And in fact, there is actually, I think there's a stark uh, and intense beauty in some of these altered landscapes that can draw us to the cause. The thirsty lake reveals its history and reminds us where we've come from. And we're reconnecting um, and reconciling our relationship with both our industrial and our, and our colonial past. Um, there are ancestors in the landscape, both human and, and natural. And we're in the forest sometimes with kids and showing them the old red of the of the cedar stumps as they return to the earth and asking them to, to visualize or remember what this forest may have looked like 150 years ago. And it's so important that we are also reconciling our relationship with the original guardians of this landscape. And our work is converging like rivers and reminding us much like the convergence of these rivers right here in the valley that collaboration is absolutely key uh, to, to our collective efforts. And tonight, just you know, hearing again from Tim and Jennifer and seeing you all here um, and being willing to take part in this event reminds us how integral uh, collaboration is gonna be to our climate resilience and our ability to stitch together these altered landscapes. So thank you for that. And we would love it if you have any questions. Um, we would love, I will stop share and um, and we'll have a look there. So we have our first question from Jay there. There we go. So Jay, so how much does the Comox Glacier contribute to water that flows into Comox Lake? So Tim, are you off mute too? I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this one is that it's not as much no, as I'm we good. think. You're there, it's not as much as we think. It is a factor, I don't know if you have a percentage, but we have a bit of a sense like the glacier is our drinking water, but it's more uh, complex than that. And if, in fact, a lot of that snow retention on the mountains is integral to our drinking water. But in the presentation, it's very reflective. It almost is a more, it tells the story of shifting temperature and climate, but it's predicted that within 20 years, all the glaciers on Vancouver Island um, uh, will be gone. And that's part of that reflective phenomenon. Uh, you have anything to add to that, Tim? Yeah, just to say, I think that the studies from um, UVic uh, glaciologists have suggested that the Comox Glacier will be gone in 20 years. There might be other ones on the island that stick around a little bit longer than that. But um, yeah, looking at the photos that Fred Fern provided us with, it seems unlikely that the, the Comox Glacier would last even as long as 20 years from now. It, it, it's going down really fast. Um, the science work that I've looked at with particular relation to the Comox Glacier is that it provides 3% um, of the water um, into Comox Lake on an annual basis, which doesn't sound like a very large percentage, but it it is the water that's coming in in the summer months, whereas the rains don't um, typically provide so much water in the summer months, so it's important. But, um, but the snowpack piece uh, is, I think, the, the really big um, contributor uh, in terms of um, providing water to the lake in the summer months. Um, again, that study was done by Ecofish Research in Comox Valley here and probably is available online or I can help people find it if they're interested. Cool. So we see a couple of questions in the chat um, for Jennifer and Jesse Morin has answered one of them related to the fences along the dike road, the small woven islands installed by the Comox Watchmen. Jesse, yeah. do you wanna, Jesse Morin, can you, are you available to jump in on that? Yep, can folks hear me? Yep. So my understanding is that uh, Corey Frank and the Guardian Watchmen have installed those fence installations that look sort of like fish weirs to protect those little islands in there from the geese that are eating whatever little plant they're trying to reestablish. So they want that plant to reestablish. There's way too many geese in that estuary. You know, that's a problem into itself. And the fences are built to keep the geese out from eating those, whatever the plants they are. I'll ask, I'll ask them tomorrow and I can even email in a, a more detailed response, but I'll see those guys first thing tomorrow morning. 
Yeah, I was just going to add. I know a thing or two uh, about that. Uh, I could add some color to that. That is that the um, in 1950s, I think it was 1956, the government of Canada decided that it would make sense to enhance hunting opportunities by uh, introducing a population of Canada geese from the prairies to the west coast uh, to enhance uh, geese hunting opportunities. And uh, up until that point in time, our Canada geese here were migratory. So they'd only come through in the spring and in the fall. But what's happened uh, through that introduction is the establishment of a resident population of Canada geese. And, um, and they are here by the thousands all year round. And uh, that was not the case previously. They eat the um, Carex lingbii or the, or the Carex sedge in estuaries as much as they do soccer fields and golf courses and, and other habitats as well. Um, but that uh, Carex lingbii um, is is basically what we call the the food of the salmon. It's the uh, the nursery habitat for for juvenile fish. Um, so they're having a significant impact on that. And so the fencing is an experiment to um, can to consider whether or not those estuary uh, com complexes can rebound um, naturally once geese are no longer present. So that's kind of the point of that exercise. And the Comox Guardians have done a great job in um, using traditional resources uh, and that natural kind of, um, you know, woven wattle fence rather than plastic fencing, which was typically done up until quite recently. So that's a, a touch that they've put on the project that I think is quite welcome. So there's a couple of questions there. Maybe Jesse Kettler, can you pull those questions for Jennifer from Project Watershed? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> I'll have to go back, I think, because we had quite a few come oh, in. No, there's one right there from Leroy McFarlane. I just wanted to get my, it be not only my voice. I, I, I can see them there. I can okay, see great. Them, so I can just start answering. <laughs> Perfect. With that. Okay. So the first was about, are we conducting surveys of particular habitats used by juveniles out migrating salmon in the estuary? Yes, we are. So we have some baseline work that was done. And then we actually just uh, set up a whole new study for pre and post juvenile usage of um, Hollyhock Marsh and the Couscousum area, because that's going to be really important to determine if we do a successful restoration of the Couscousum site. We need to understand, and we already do have some good baseline data now about current juvenile usage of that area in the estuary, but we need to understand how it changes as we do that restoration. So hopefully that answers your question. There's some uh, others about sea level rise there. Yeah, so there was somebody was asking about um, the salt marsh work that we're doing and how do we protect that from erosion. So what we do is uh, like with those barrier islands that you saw, we actually, there's the front edge of it, we use uh, some large rock, which is about the same size as the rock that's found in the natural area and it's round beach rock. And we slope it at a one to 10 slope on the front leading edge of those planting berms. And what that does is it creates a natural wave run up that diffuses the wave energy. And that's how it protects those areas from getting washed out. And then over time, the plants themselves, as they, they grow, they help uh, keep those sediments in place as well too and prevent them from being washed away. So hopefully I answered that one. But goose fit. Question here yeah. about goose fit. Will goose fit be breached by sea level rise? And if so, what will be the impacts from Ken McDonald? Does anyone want to take that? Good, Jennifer. Uh, well, from the sea level rise maps that I've seen and the predictions that I've seen, yes, it, it will be breached and it will be flooded over. Um, and it, at some point, um, I have if the uh, predictions and the models are correct, yes, that, that will be an issue and we will simply lose that site. So that will be the impact is that it'll just be lost. We won't be able to get it back. And I would just add to that, uh, that's a great response, Jennifer, thank you. But I would also add that um, with increasing storm surge and sea level rise, you would normally expect to see uh, more erosion from, from those feeder bluffs replenishing goose spit but because we've locked them up and armored them with, with riprap and, and logs, that likely won't happen, which is part of the reason why goose bit will probably disappear. If we were able to unlock the, the sediment load that would normally erode from those cliffs, um, perhaps there would be a balance point between erosion and deposition that would result in, in goose bit um, staying as a spit. 
but um, I don't see that happening given the, uh, the way that we've transformed that particular part of the shoreline. Yeah, I agree with that. We're actually doing forage fish monitoring on goose spit right now, and we're seeing changes in the suitable sediment for forage fish. They kind of like a small gravelly sort of shell hash area that they want to lay their eggs in. And we're already seeing the loss of that suitable habitat. And it's because we've cut off that supply from those feeder bluffs. Okay, we have another question. Um, is anything being done? This is from Mark. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to take it. Is anything being done to reduce or diminish active logging? Um, probably Tim or no, Megan. I'll take that one. I'll oh, you'll take in. that one in the upper Comox Lake watershed. Uh, from what I've seen, this is so destructive and logging goes almost to the very edges of the streams and lakes in that area. Well, maybe I'll take part of it. <laughs> Tim can take part of it. So one of the challenges, um, which we did, I didn't get into as deeply as I do in some of our presentations, is the nature of land ownership within the Comox Lake watershed, which is a historical legacy of that Hudson Bay Company land grant and subsequent grants to Dunsmuir, um, the two million acres, the southern east quadrant of Vancouver Island that transferred into private hands. So as a result, although there's a lot of discussion in the airwaves right now around old growth logging practices and crown land grants and timber licenses, we actually are dealing with an entirely different set of land ownership and, and, um, and uh, forest management principles. And that's the Private Forest Managed Lands Act. So is anything happening as it relates to that? Yes, there are many people that are speaking. There's been a, the provincial government did an engagement process and asked for input on the Private Managed Forest Lands Act. And I know that there was a lot of input from across sectors related to watershed impacts on Vancouver Island. You know, um, we have, um, we have a, a landowner that's operating within the law that applies um, to private forest managed lands. And so these kinds of conversations are larger political conversations about how it is that we're gonna translate things like the Water Sustainability Act and source water protection legislation um, and water security legislation into regulation and how that will intersect with Private Forest Managed Land um, Act and uh, those operating underneath that legislation. And that sounds very, I mean, the, the biggest thing I would say is um, from a conservation perspective here, I think something that's really important is for us to understand how our situation is different from many other places in the province and maybe other places where the story is taking up a larger part of the airwaves. So I sometimes am, find it interesting, some of the conversations about old growth logging locally and, and, and wish that we could somehow dive deeper into the dialogue about what it means um, to do watershed protection and some of the um, potential that exists to uh, pull forests out of um, harvesting cycles and allow them to evolve into um, old growth forests with the ecological attributes of old growth forests. But the big thing is, is that there's a very different legislation that applies to land ownership, which is, and there's one big land owner in the watershed. And so it's a, it's a bigger uh, political um, and, and essentially regulatory discussion that I think is a really important and interesting one for all of us to be involved in in the Comox Valley. I think we missed a question from Leroy earlier for Jennifer. Um, City of Campbell River believes that sea level rise is not an issue because Vancouver Island is moving upwards by the tectonic plates. Do you agree? Please comment further. That's for Jennifer. Not really my area of expertise. Okay. I, yeah, but what I've seen from the modeling, sort of the, the south half of Vancouver Island is rebounding and the northern half is sort of sinking a little bit. Um, oh, okay. But I think sea level rise is probably happening a lot quicker than now uh, isostatic rebound if that's what's pushing us up. Yeah. Okay. Um, question from uh, Should sand be dredged to be added to the beach at Goose Spit below the bluffs, or would that be detrimental to the aquatic areas? Yeah, if you have. Well, first of all, it's where you get those dredge materials from. It has to be suitable sediments, so it has to be clean, um, and it has to be done in the right way, for sure. Um, but there potentially can be some benefit from renourishing beaches, yes. Long story short, yes, that it might be a, something that needs to be looked at in the future for that site. And, and if I can jump in, while I would agree 100%, with Jennifer, I would suggest that it's, um, it's just as important, if not more so, to restore the ecological processes than, than sort of the band-aid fixes of dumping sand. Like, I think it 
would be more effective to remove the riprap armoring along those feeder bluffs and reactivate that natural supply and let the longshore currents and movements um, replenish the spit um, than to, to dump sand. But um, if for whatever reason that's not possible, then then I, I would also sort of support the uh, the idea of, of keeping um, the spit alive if you were through artificial means. But um, letting nature take its course is my preference for sure. Yeah, we're at time for probably just like a couple more and then we'll actually end on time. <laughs> or if any one of the panelists also has a thought that's come up or a question they want to fire at one of the other panelists. And if not, there was a thank you to you, Megan, that I read from what you said, a lot of this issue boils down to political courage and will to make the needed legislative and regulatory changes from Mark. Yeah, that yeah. would be my, my analysis. Mm -hmm. I lovely. Thank you. Well, I think this is a really good segue just to pass back to, to Jesse um, as we prepare for tomorrow, because this has been amazing. What an amazing, um, you know, that you've all stuck around. So let's not try and keep you yeah, too much longer. We still have 89 people here. I know. <laughs> we had a, we had a, I think we had 100. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we pass it back to Jesse to wrap up? And uh, Kara maybe has a slide about tomorrow as well. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. Well, this is a really informative, uh, awesome evening. Um, so thanks for everyone joining us. And thanks to all the presenters. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow morning as we continue to explore the resilience of our watershed and our community. The first session tomorrow morning is at 9 a.m. It's called Water, Place, and Reconciliation, and it'll explore the complex collaborative work of Comox First Nation, Project Watershed, and the City of Courtney in purchasing and restoring the Couscous Sum site in the Courtney Estuary. And this is an incredible story. Then at 10.30, we head back to Comox Lake Watershed for regional collaboration for watershed resilience to learn how local governments and the conservation community are reframing the task of watershed protection and looking at the diverse values and ecological assets in the landscape that can be leveraged to support the important task of protecting drinking water. So thanks again for taking the time to join us and for this learning opportunity and we'll see you all tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm.